So, uh, so this talk is going to be specifically on the question uh, of reality or uh, of, uh, of realism. And uh, see, now I have, here we go. Um, so this is, uh, this is the overview. Um, I want to start with some very brief kind of contextual questions uh, as guidance and, and focus point for our investigation. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, my approach these days is actually very much um, uh, to kind of embed thinkers uh, in their time to explore the intellectual connections or the living connections, the really kind of, you know, the lived, uh, the lived experience out of which uh, certain ideas uh, arise. I will say something very briefly on Shayla and Stein and their encounters in life uh, and work. Um, then I will focus on uh, Shayla's ideas from idealism, realism, and uh, point to some of the key ideas, uh, then uh, move to Stein, uh, say something about the key ideas on the realism and potency in act, and then uh, we'll move on uh, to some passages from finite and eternal being. And uh, the, uh, the final point there, which I kind of phrased from the position on realism to the philosophical starting point. So this is something that very much interests me, as I said, to kind of see how can we see something of the philosophical positions that these thinkers hold reflected uh, really in their specific positions on, uh, on realism and reality. And then, then some points uh, in conclusion. Uh, one of my questions always is how compatible uh, are these um, are these thinkers? So I'm not going to go through all of these questions. I think if you look at the contextual questions in the bigger context, the uh, the three key points are probably more, uh, but there are three key points that could be explored in more detail. One is the role of demarcation from Husserl position. I will say something about that in the end, how both stand in terms uh, of Husserl's development. Uh, then secondly. Um, there has been the point being made that uh, the, uh, the neo-scholasticism and phenomenology actually have a lot more in common uh, than we might think. And one, uh, uh, one scholar has pointed out this could be due to the influence of the realism of the neo-scholastics in Munich. This is interesting for Scheler because uh, Scheler, of course, was in Munich for a time. Uh, and of course, with Stein, we all have very strongly the, uh, the neo-scholastic influence. Um, and then finally, uh, something of the role of the respective worldviews. And I will spend a little bit more time on that. So why realism? Uh, so this is a statement uh, Shaler made in Idealism, Realism. He said, among the greatest opposites uh, that exist uh, in philosophical um, ontology and epistemology, still today belongs the ideological standpunktliche opposition, which is called Idealism and Realism, the German philosophy of the present and of the recent past. This extremely comprehensive opposition has above all uh, taken on two more specific subforms, it became the opposition of the so-called idealism of consciousness and the so-called critical realism. And uh, Stein uh, states in, in Potency and Act, so we have the context here of the statement is that she's looking at the forming of the actual life of the soul by the species sensibilis and uh, the species intelligibilis. The phantasma, before entering into the context of view, the Anschauungszusammenhang, is not yet species sensibilis. It becomes that through the ensouling perception, the right interpretation of this transformation is of highest philosophical interest. Here's the point at which idealism and realism separate. So both thinkers were very much concerned with that. For the sake of this talk, I will focus on two questions uh, specifically, and they are related, but they're not the same. And the first one is, how do we know that something is real at all? And the second related question is, can we know the real? Or if you want to translate that into the terms of, uh, of the philosophers of the time, uh, can we know something about the whatness of that which is real? And we will see that, uh, uh, both uh, Shale and Stein, Stein uh, quite significantly diverge on both of those uh, answers. Uh, a quick overview, uh, most of you will know this, uh, on the kind of German philosophical landscape, so to speak, of the past. Uh, Shale had surveyed that uh, in his uh, work, German philosophy of the present from 1922. And he identifies with regard to realism, three main directions. First, the revitalization of the old scholastic realism. So here refers to Mercy von Hertling and Great. 
Uh, he, of course, does not mention Stein, uh, but I've put her there because the question is, is this where we put Stein or where we would put Stein from kind of Schaler's perspective, so to speak. The second one, the critical realism here, he refers to the more kind of, you know, contemporary thinkers, Kulpe, Erdmann, Stumpf, and, uh, and Meinung. He does say, however, that also some of the neo-scholastic thinkers tend more in the direction of critical realism. And then we have the intuitionism. So we have the life philosopher with Boxon, we have Losky and Völkelt. And, uh, and the voluntative realism here, he places uh, Dilte, Frisch, Eisen, Köhler, Jens, and Scheler, uh, Scheler himself, even though, as we will say, uh, Scheler refers a lot to Dilte, but is actually quite critical also of Dilte's approach. So it's an interesting kind of, you know, a sketching out the landscape uh, from, Scheler's, from Scheler's perspective. Again, I said the, the focus is uh, Scheler's idealism, realism, 1927-28. Uh, it was published in the Philosophische Anzeiger. The tricky thing with Scheler is that he only published part two and part three. Um, so he didn't publish part one and he was kind of announcing uh, part one, uh, four and five later. Uh, we have parts of, of the uh, part four uh, published in the uh, in the Gesammelte Werke. Uh, but really we're looking at part two and part three. And then Edith Stein, Potency and Act, uh, 1931. That was her attempt at tabulation in Freiburg, and uh, which was not successful, uh, and it was uh, unpublished until 1998. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the big work, uh, Finite and Eternal Being, 1938, and then first published in 1950. So what is my particular perspective on the question? Uh, and here I refer to, to Hans Reiner Zepp. And Hans Reiner Zepp says, what is remarkable about uh, the second novel edition of the debate, and that is a debate on idealism, realism. Rather, is that the position uh, individuals took in the realism, idealism dispute simultaneously revealed their own philosophical uh, location or standpoint. And this is really something I am personally most interested in. And this is something we will be uh, taking up and picking up uh, towards the end of the talk to see, well, what does it tell us where those two thinkers stand? How does it impact? on what stance they take uh, towards uh, the realism uh, position. Very, very briefly, uh, and we could say we could say more about it here. Uh, of course, Scheler and Stein knew each other. Uh, we know of the first encounters in Göttingen in 1913. Uh, Edith Stein gave a quite beautiful impression uh, of Scheler uh, in, uh, in her autobiography from the life of Jewish family. Uh, and of the years of study in Göttingen. And here's the famous statement where she says that she never really has encountered the phenomenon of genius as a purely as in Shaler. But she also would say there was something demonic about Shaler, which is a very, very interesting uh, assessment. Uh, we know from their, uh, from their works that we see a mutual recognition and criticism. So they engage with each other's work, but mainly in the field of value theory and, uh, and sympathy feelings. And it's interesting, um, uh, Stein keeps referring uh, to Scheler throughout in, uh, in some of her letters. For us, what's interesting, I think, is that in uh, Potency and Act and uh, Final Internal Being, Stein mentions Scheler, but not in connection with the question of realism per se, but rather in questions concerning the human condition and, of course, the material value theory. So, Let's say something uh, about Scheler's position in idealism, uh, realism. Scheler starts off with something which is very typical Scheler. So once you see this, you see this everywhere. Uh, Scheler sets up these uh, oppositional viewpoints. And then he would say, well, you know, uh, there's something to in either of them, but neither of them uh, are correct in their kind of absoluteness, right? So he uses the same approach uh, when talking about idealism, realism. He says neither idealism nor criticalism are correct since both are based on false premises. And we're not going to go through all of these premises, but the important one or the most important one for us here is the false assumption that so sein and Dasein uh, in knowledge are considered inseparable in relation to the imminence of consciousness. And Scheler says uh, that is not the case. Uh, and it's a tricky one. Again, I think we'll come back to that maybe also in the discussion. Um, there's always these debates around how to translate certain terms. I have, after a long battle, decided to translate those as kind of whatness or individuated uh, essences. And uh, Scheler then uh, makes the point that being real 
uh, is experienced as resistance. And he develops this point uh, in particular, this critical reference uh, to, uh, to Dilte, and this is the point we will, uh, we will concentrate on. What does it mean that reality is experienced as resistance? Scheler says that Dilti correctly recognizes the givenness of the real uh, through resistance, but Dilti makes four mistakes. First, he interprets resistance as, interpre uh, as, as mediated, right? And of course, also for then for Dilti as it's mediated through the, uh, through the senses. Second, Dilte mixes his theory of reality with the false assumption that everything given is imminent to consciousness. Thirdly, Dilte understands resistance as an experience of the will, and that is of the conscious central will or conscious uh, uh, volition. And finally, uh, uh, Scheler says, Dilte makes the mistake that he establishes a too close connection between the experience of reality and the experience of the external world. So when Dilti talks about reality, he seems to equate that by and large with the, uh, with the external world. What is Scheler's response? Scheler argues that resistance, so Widerstand, something that resists against, uh, against me, is given to the urge or the drive impulses. So it's not given to the senses. This is really important. It's given uh, a resistance against the, uh, the urge, against the drang, uh, and therefore the experience of resistance is unmediated and sui generis. It is an ecstatic experience, and by that, Shayla means it's in having instead of knowing. And this is really one of the key arguments against Husserl, because Scheler will argue that all consciousness only emerges from the prior suffering, the alliden of resistant objects. He states it is not the will, but our involuntary spontaneous drives, drive impulses that experience uh, resistance. Uh, and finally, a very interesting, and he unfolds that in, uh, in some detail in idealism, realism, says reality does not only refer to the outside world, but to four different spheres. Uh, and important here that those spheres are not traceable or reducible to each other. And the four spheres are, ends are, say, relative being, in and outer world, living being in the world, and the ego and the community uh, sphere. Important consequence that not only the outside world is experienced as resistant. This is a quote inhibition of the libidinal attention, especially of its dynamic side, the experience of inhibition and resistance can occur as well in accompaniment of optical as of acoustic and other sensual uh, perceptions. And it can be given, as we will show, also in memory and thought objects. For example, the state given only to the thought resists my will. Resistance is thus a central experience of the stage of myself, which is provisionally determined as a libidinal life center. So this is interesting because, of course, this means for Shela that all living beings can experience this resistance, and that means all living beings have an experience of, uh, of reality. This has interesting consequences, and one of the consequences is that time is experienced as something real. So the dynamic experience of the future lies in a certain margin of co-experienced mightiness, which constantly decreases in the aging process, whereas the other sphere, the sphere of the unchangeable being in the form of an intensely increasing dynamic experience of resistance of its past, pressing on and weighing down the present constantly increases. Shela has separately really, really interesting reflections on aging. Uh, and these reflections here on resistance, again, play, uh, play a role there. But it's interesting also that means that past experience have actually a reality in so far as they can press on the, uh, on the present. The reality of something has been, uh, that has been is given to me primarily not by so-called memory images, but by resistance and the pressure on my present experience, by pressure from something that is no longer alterable by my willpower. So I would find it quite interesting, for example, if you look at uh, uh, things like experience of trauma, um, I'm kind of wondering if you know if you, if you could use Shaler there and uh, in terms of analyzing what is actually going on there from a phenomenological uh, perspective. 
So what does it say about the reality kind of so sein? Here I have it still as suchness, whatness, individualized um, uh, essence and Dasein existence. It says the relation uh, resistance drive impulses is not a relation to essence or meaning, but is pre-conscious. We grasp the real thing of an indeterminate something before we perceive it with the senses or think it's uh, it's suchness. It's quite interesting because what Shaler uh, what Shaler does he sets up uh, not also here but in other books also a so sein against against Dasein and it seems somehow that he he copies you know the the traditional. Um, uh, you know, two points of uh, essentia, essence on the one side, and then existence on the other. But then Shaler is also using Basin, uh, which we, we could also translate as essence, but also as nature, but he's also using the term essentia per se. So, so it's interesting um, uh, how Shaler is using these, how Shaler is using these terms. What are the consequences of Shaler's approach? And they're quite, um, they're quite extreme in some ways. He says the encounter with the real is not an encounter with meaning, but is the foundation of all possible relations with meaning. If we don't experience resistance, we don't experience meaning at all. Resistance remains transcendental to consciousness at all times. Shaler thinks that Zosan can be in mentor and extra mentor, but Dasein, so existence, is always extra mental. And then he, he makes the remark about that we've kind of seen a lot of discussion. He says, ideas are neither ante rebus nor in rebus, but only cum rebus. And I had some discussions uh, with, uh, with fellow scholars about this, but what does this, uh, what does this actually mean? Because he doesn't really explain it. Uh, and I'm happy to hear what, what people think about it afterwards. I'm assuming one approach here could be that this is similar to the value theory that in the engagement uh, with the things uh, the ideas, uh, the ideas appear, but he doesn't really kind of specifically explain that uh, in more uh, in more detail. So Dasein remains essential, transcendent to knowledge and consciousness, alien to knowledge and consciousness, and independent, essentially transcendent. And he says in the borderline case, in the grand situation also for a divine omniscient spirit. So the Shaler of 1928 is not the Catholic Shaler any longer. He's the Shaler who says, I've actually never really been a Catholic. I've never, you know, I've never really been a theist. Um, he doesn't lose his sense for what he now calls the ground of being. But this statement to say that Dasein is not even accessible in, uh, in knowledge by the divine uh, spirit is a very, very strong statement indeed. How does this look now for uh, for Edith Stein? Uh, and so again, we I focus here on uh, some uh, aspects in potency and act, and some aspects in finite uh, and internal being. So just a little bit of context here. Uh, the Stein we are talking about here is the Stein of the uh, Thomistic phase of the middle period, kind of roughly between the mid late twenties and the mid late thirties. Uh, uh, this is the assessment by by Herflinger, and uh, uh, this is a, a quote from her letter. She said that it is possible to exercise science as worship of God became clear to me, first of all, with St. Thomas. And only then could I decide again to seriously dedicate myself again to, uh, to scholarship. Now, what Stein has, because she comes, of course, to Thomas uh, quite late in her philosophical career, is actually a very strongly neo-Thomistic angle. Uh, and that is very much influenced by late medieval thinkers such as Scotus and Bonaventure. And she's aware of that, at least with regard to Scotus to some extent. Uh, and she's very much impacted by neo Thomas such as Pshivara, Mariton, Great uh, Angel Song. And I do think what's standing in the background for, uh, for Stein really is the question if a Christian philosophy uh, is possible. And also at that time, uh, very strongly, uh, people know this, she tries to combine her kind of two philosophical passions, so to speak, at that time, which is Thomism with phenomenology. So phenomenology stays, stays there, and it is her first, it is her first approach to philosophy, uh, and she keeps bringing it back into the debates. Uh, Potency and Act, uh, 1931, 
Uh, the key Thomistic sources here that she refers to is the Questionis Disputate de Veritate and De Potentia, uh, Esper, uh, Andreas Sper, the Thomas really kind of wrote kind of an excellent introduction also to the translations uh, that Stein did, uh, very, very informative, very comprehensive. And um, Potency and Act really is an attempt of Stein to familiarize herself with the Thomistic methodology. And that is something she says at the very beginning of uh, a Potency and Act. And the question of reality is not really the main question of the work. And of course, it is entailed in the question of actuality. And, and she would say that that what is real is that which is actual, which is also uh, the position of Aquinas. And uh, But she addresses the question of, of reality uh, uh, specifically in a, way, in a relatively short section in part uh, six under point, uh, under, point T, under point D. And that's the excursus on transcendental uh, idealism. And that is really concerned how what is real is given to us. And I think then it's interesting for us to see how he or she starts differing from, uh, from Scheler. So Stein argues that the stimuli that cause sensations kind of approach me, and I put it in a quotation mark, as something that is coming from the, uh, from the outside. And what happens is that certain sensations arouse intentions in the mental uh, subject. So being conscious then very, very much depends on what it has consciousness of. And that means that all intentional life proves to be objectively bound to some extent in so far as it is based on the material world. And uh, Stein does concede uh, the co-conditionality of world structures by uh, by the subject. So it's relatively straightforward. This, of course, kind of her engagement also with, uh, uh, with Husserl's um, uh, famous or infamous turn. I know there's a debate if that turn actually took place. Uh, but here we have kind of Stein uh, looking at it uh, in terms of, well, how can I actually perceive something? How is something given to me uh, as, uh, as real? The consequences are that uh, the subject for Stein is something that is uh, Aufgeschlossen, uh, um, uh, is, is, is open as an intellectual subject. And, and it's interesting because I think she's right in, in her approach. She says all perception also is an ability of reason, is a Verstandesleistung. And so she looks at the, uh, at the medieval distinction, at the uh, distinctions between the uh, species sensibilis and the species intelligibilis. And she says, well, actually, if we really look at this, what is perceived is already a combination of the two, is already uh, a species sensibilis intelligibilis. Um, again, following, um, following Aquinas, uh, she argues that abstraction is central both for the senses and for, uh, and for reason. The latter is being able to abstract from matter and thus achieves a formal extraction of reason, the formale Verstandes abstraction. And that then reveals the species and the in, in, in kind of two different ways. And here again, we have, you know, uh, Stein, the phenomenologist coming back in again. So we have on the one side, the nomadic ontic form of the thing. And then on the other hand, we have the noetic form of the thing. So she's, she's really working herself uh, her way through, uh, through Aquinas and through the uh, and through the different uh, terminologies in some ways this becomes much more developed in uh, in finite and eternal being and she kind of says when she thinks about reworking potency and act she says in one of the letters she will really completely rework it and there won't be much left of the original potency and act once she uh, develops her ideas in finite and eternal being and this is an interesting work because Yes, Stein also tries here to combine uh, phenomenology and Aquinas, but she also wants to go beyond Aquinas where necessary. And I think that fits in with her idea of a philosopher, uh, that you develop ideas, but if you think it's necessary to go beyond something, then this is what you, this is what you ought to do, rather than just listening uh, to authority. And in finite and eternal being, the question of reality does come more to the fore uh, and specifically when she does gas as real being or actual being, uh, uh, specifically in part three on essential and uh, and actual being. So this is uh, where we're going to, to look at next in some more uh, detail. Um, 
just again, in terms of context, I think specifically in, in the course of Stein's later thinking, the act of faith becomes increasingly uh, decisive. And uh, that means, of course, um, that a concept of, of realism must be essentially connected to, uh, to the knowledge of essences. So she's very much working here within the, uh, within the Thomistic uh, terminology. Uh, and she traces the idea of realism uh, back to the concept uh, of race uh, in, uh, uh, in Aquinas. And she states uh, that she's in agreement with uh, Aquinas and so far as she also tends to moderate realism. So she, she develops uh, uh, very briefly how she thinks that Thomism falls into kind of a, a naive realism and a bit more of a moderate realism. And um, so she thinks Thomas is kind of the more moderate realism. Uh, but she said she is going beyond uh, Aquinas here and she's actually more following uh, Scotus. And we will see uh, why she is saying that um, because she thinks it's not the universals uh, that are real, but the individual or thisness. So that is the famous concept of Hecatus uh, that, uh, that Scotus uh, develops and that Stein, uh, that Stein actually picks up. So what is happening here? Stein states that the knowing mind is an individual actuality, is an Einzelnes, uh, Wirkliches. And how do now these different kind of, you know, essence and existence, uh, quiditas and so on, how do they come together? And Stein quotes directly Aquinas from his commentary on, uh, on Aristotle's metaphysics. She so says, uh, the same is capable of a double way of being. So we have the the being in the thing, so the, the real or actual being, and then the, the being in the mind. And so again, she quotes Aquinas saying, the species is the same and in the thing and in the mind, however, not in the same way. So what we have here is some kind of isomorphism. So that means we see um, kind of a structural similarity that allows us to connect uh, the, uh, the species as it exists in the thing and the species as it exists in the mind, but in uh, but in different ways, and uh, it's quite tricky because um, so I'm not a medievalist at all, um, uh, obviously, but uh, what happens in the late 13th century that the term forma starts being replaced with species, uh, and Aquinas and Aquinas is using that, and then Stein uh, Stein is picking that uh, is picking that up. Um, so Stein then, then argues uh, using the ex expression quitatim sive sentem entis, individual uh, essences exist only, uh, only in the thing. And this is where uh, the essence, as we will see, uh, will become real. So what happens is, and in this translation I followed, um, uh, so this is not my translation, I followed the translation of finite and eternal being because I find uh, to make the, to translate the distinctions uh, into English quite, uh, quite tricky. Uh, said that the essence, the Wesenheit, so what we're talking here is, is the universal um, uh, essences, only enters into a relationship with the real world via the whatness, the washeit. So here's that we have the quiditas uh, and the nature, the Wesen um, um, uh, of the being. So Wesen here becomes kind of the, the, the individuated uh, uh, or instantiated essence of a thing as a concrete essence. So that means the essence becomes real in the thing as an individual essence in the thing. And uh, I think what, what's important or interesting for me here is that the Thomistic aspect of this approach, which is still there, even though she combines it with, uh, uh, with Scotus or kind of leans the more towards Scotus with the Hecatus, that Aquinas in this particular aspect follows very, very closely Aristotle. So Aquinas doesn't really have this kind of old theory of, of, of reality because kind of he takes what's, what's there and uh, you know, kind of brings it together. And that means Stein in this particular approach, in so far as we can see Thomas, we can actually see Aristotle. And uh, from my personal perspective, the Christian aspect which is really important overall, uh, is a, it's, a, it's a little bit less uh, visible here in this particular question on, uh, uh, on reality. <laughs>
Now, clearly, Shayla died before Stein uh, developed her, her theories, but we could kind of ask ourselves, well, what kind of realist would Stein be for Shayla? Because they're both realists. Uh, and I think Stein would broadly, very broadly, fall into the categories first of the old scholastic realism. Uh, again, using both Scotus and Aquinas in her approach uh, uh, with their methodology, um, uh, that uh, specifically Thomas said, cognition is an, an analogia entis, uh, and a, a relationship and a participation of, uh, of being. And of course, she also goes back to Pshivara, who has a very particular interpretation of the analogia uh, entis. And what we also have here is a certain objectivity of the sensory uh, qualities. I do think she shows some aspect of what Shela would uh, consider to be critical realism, uh, and which Shela kind of says you know, a number of the neo-scholastic attempts, namely to win reality through acts of thinking or reason. So we have really, uh, we have a combination uh, of the two. So this is something where kind of my passion lies at the moment. I suppose I'm really, really interested in, uh, you know, when thinkers hold a certain position, where is that coming from? How does that fit in uh, in the overall uh, in the overall position, in the overall worldview? And we keep this uh, relatively brief and to the surface, but I'm very happy to uh, to get more into discussion on this uh, um, uh, after the talk. Uh, so. I kind of broadly divide it into three aspects. So first of all, we have the we have the worldview. Um, and of course, we have, uh, as you know, we have Stein, who's becoming more Christian, and we have Shaler, who's moving away from Christianity. Um, then we have, uh, of course, there are different uh, approaches to phenomenology. Um, and really, for me, this boils down uh, uh, to method versus attitude in a way, and which I think is actually quite important uh, here as the third aspect. And I will only mention some brief points here. And that is there are uh, quite different approaches to, uh, to anthropology. And again, I think they're, they're both personalists, uh, but again, here, once you dig deeper into the kind of personalism they adhere to, the differences are quite, uh, quite clear. But we will only go back to some kind of uh, what I see as major issues. Uh, so maybe just a little bit more, uh, more detail. Um, when Shela, uh, when Shela was writing on the eternal in man, uh, he made very clear that for him, uh, uh, metaphysics and, and faith religion are independent of each other in their intention. Uh, and that has given rise to, uh, to a lot of criticism. Uh, so Pshivara had written uh, quite an interesting book on, uh, on Newman and, uh, and Shela and uh, is trying to, to, to criticize Shela quite severely for this because he says, well, actually both metaphysics and, and religion point to the same ends reale. Um, and Shela says, yeah, that's true, they do, but their intention, their intentional objects are different. So metaphysics points to something that he will then kind of later call the ground of being. And uh, while he says uh, the, uh, the intentional object, the God as intentional object of religion uh, has actually to do with salvation. Okay, so even while in the in the ends reality these may be the same, the intentional objects are different. Again, the later Shaler uh, gives priority to metaphysics. I think he really he's following his own logic, the logic of his own thinking through, and uh, uh, but also his very quite specific philosophical anthropology becomes important. Stein, in some ways, is moving the other way around. Faith becomes fundamental, uh, also for her to uh, to philosophy. And uh, what I think is interesting here, that Stein in this particular aspect combines actually a Thomas with Bonaventure because Aquinas also keeps um, uh, uh, religion and philosophy quite separate. And, uh, and Stein brings them again uh, back together in, in her ontology uh, from the medieval aspects. Of course, we have other contemporary thinkers, thinkers standing in the background here. I think in her ontology, she's really also quite close to Scotus. And this is something she uh, she acknowledges herself. And the Akeitas really is a very, very interesting concept. I think the way she approaches it, uh, it's the logic of your argument. It, uh, it works. I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, phenomenology, Stein remains very scientific. Uh, she remains very Husserlian in this. Phenomenology is, a, is seen as a method. Um, Shaler makes quite clear that phenomenology is, um, well, it's at least also an attitude, an Einstellung. So he, he says it's more it's more an attitude than a method. And, and his idea is what, what happens in phenomenology for him is we stand back, we take ourselves back 
and let the things appear uh, in front of us. And, and I remember when I was younger, when I started looking into these questions, I always found that one quite fascinating um, because it means when you direct your attention towards something, you're stepping back, you're not imposing yourself on it, you're stepping back and letting the thing appear in, uh, in front of you. I do think we have quite substantial differences in the uh, in the anthropology, and my feeling is that uh, some of the differences that we see in the approach to realism can probably be traced back to their different anthropological viewpoints. And uh, so, so Shaler, you kind of saw that uh, Shaler has this idea of what he calls primordial phenomena it was a big thing at the time, comes from Goethe, everyone's talking about it. Uh, and Scheler identifies certain things as primordial phenomena, as urphenomene, and one of them is Geist, uh, uh, and one of them is, is Leben. And uh, Leben and, uh, and uh, Trieb are substantially connected, and uh, they really are the main components of, uh, of human existence. And again, I put it in quotation marks because it's not an ideal way of, of phrasing it. Didn't come, I don't know, I couldn't find a better way of phrasing it. Uh, so it really, if you look at the human being, the human being is life and spirit uh, who intrinsically interact in the human being, uh, bring forth the person. And, and Shale, of course, makes the famous statement that the person exists only in and through their acts. Um, and quite a, um, um, what do I say, controversial, a statement that Shaler, the later Shaler makes, in, in the earlier Shaler, I don't think we find that, is the idea of the powerlessness of the spirit. Uh, and that was really questioned by a lot of contemporary thinkers. The powerlessness of the, uh, of the spirit means the spirit needs the life force, the life energy, literally to come alive, but also then to be able to affect anything, uh, uh, to affect anything in the world. So that has quite interesting consequences uh, uh, in all kinds of ways. Again, it's something we can talk about uh, afterwards if you're interested in that. But that was a really, really controversial uh, uh, position. Uh, and Stein mentions um, uh, mentions the the book *Man's Place in the Cosmos*, which is where this is uh, specifically also developed. And she says, ah, you know, uh, it doesn't come across if she's read it. But she says, well, you know, Shaler really, you know, once he's left the church, he really is losing a lot of his supporters. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how much she has engaged uh, with that particular topic in, uh, in Shaler. Also because she's going the other way. For her, the human being is the unity of body and soul. Uh, again, in some ways, uh, quite Thomistic. And uh, so we are having here a spiritualized body and a materialized soul uh, and faith again uh, for the Stein of this period becomes more and more uh, central. I said to you that I think the Husserl critique uh, is an important aspect to consider. So how does the Husserl critique looks like in, uh, in comparison? Shaler negates Husserl's position that all real units are units of meaning. Right. So he says, therefore, Husserl's principle of all principle that every original perception can be considered as a source of knowledge is wrong. Uh, and he made uh, the quite kind of graphic statement, I suppose, he says, in Husserl's absolute consciousness, reality would have disappeared as in the absolute land of milk and honey. Why? Because the experience of resistance would be gone. Right? Okay. How does it look for Stein? Stein uh, allows for co-constitution of the world by the subject. Uh, the sense data, she says, have an unsatisfactory position within the transcendental phenomenological view. And the thesis that the world is relative to consciousness uh, is rejected by her. Um, she says the problem in Husserl's idealism is if we cross out consciousness, we cross out the world. And I've emphasized those two aspects because I think uh, coming from different perspectives is, is in this part uh, that, both actually, uh, that both actually agree on. So allow me to draw a quickly some uh, conclusion. So if we, if we put the two thinkers next to each other, again, if you think about it, Stein is writing kind of five to 10 years uh, after Shaler, doesn't really engage with Shaler on the question of reality, but how do the two look like standing in the same kind of, you know, intellectual context. For Stein, experience of reality is mediated by the senses. For Shaler, it is an experience sui generis. So Shaler would criticize Stein if he would have read it the same way he criticized everyone else who says it is something that is given to us through the senses. For Stein, knowledge of Dasein, of existence, is intrinsically connected to the knowledge of, of, of essences. And for Shaler, Dasein can only be experienced, but it cannot be known. 
Stein seems to identify reality essentially with the cognition of the Hecatus. Um, again, I have the feeling by and large of the, uh, uh, of the external world uh, and Scheler assumes uh, uh, independent uh, spheres. Uh, Stein gives a very beautiful example of her uh, you know, experience of, of reality, of kind of the delight of a child. Right, and how that delight of the child becomes kind of individuated in the delight of a uh, of a particular child. Um, I think Aquinas is using kind of a similar context, not with delight, but with God trying to explain color. You know, how do we experience color again, kind of individuated uh, in, in in particular uh, individuals? And but Chela is interesting because he has these independent spheres. And he has to say, he says we we need to think what is real, much bigger than just relating. To the, uh, to the external world. That means that uh, Stein's realism would fall victim to the same criticism that Scheler raises against idealists and realists, that is whatness and existence uh, are connected in, uh, in knowledge. And, and that is uh, Stein's position, and that is something that Scheler says uh, cannot, uh, cannot happen. Now, what's interesting is that Hans Reiner Zepp actually does see an indirect possibility that the given in the sense uh, uh, of Scheler so through the experience of resistance, even if it is not accessible in, uh, in meaning, can be or could be uh, thematized uh, in Stein. Um, I'm not quite sure if he's right on that. And, and he doesn't really kind of go in, into much detail there. But it's an interesting thing to see, can we actually find a connection there between the, uh, between the two? So... If you return to our two focus questions, you know, what, what are the answers really, uh, really boil down? So, you know, how do we know that something is real? Scheler, resistance, unmediated, Stein through the senses and uh, mediated. And can we know the real? Or if, again, the whatness of that which is real? And uh, Scheler would say no, and, uh, and Stein would say yes. Uh, and then the uh, the final points really are the two of them uh, compatible. Um, well, both are realists. Uh, both agree in their key criticism of Husserl, I think. Uh, and interesting also that for both knowledge is an ontological relation. For Scheler, he then would say in the end, you know, uh, knowledge is a is, is a loving uh, relationship. And of course, these are all things that Epshivara also picks up on with uh, uh, with Scheler. But um, Zosai and the whatness, the individual essence, however you want to translate that, and existence remain ultimately distinct for Scheler, but intimately connected for Stein. For Scheler, Stein would have committed the, what he calls the logical absurdity. So Scheler can be quite scathing uh, sometimes uh, when he, if he looks at certain uh, thinkers, uh, and here it's kind of a reflection on the Neotomists of his time, he says he, she would commit the logical absurdity of those Neotomists who try to combine critical realism with Aquinas. Uh, so this is something unpublished, so we have it in the Scheler Nachlass to Switalski and Shivara, and uh, so you can look it up. It's very, very interesting. And here, by the way, um, so Svitalski severely criticized Scheler, and Scheler refers to Pshivara and says, well, if you want to understand me, uh, Pshivara really gave a very, very good kind of explanation of what I'm trying to do, even though he got it wrong in some, uh, some aspects. I think Stein's approach is more focused on knowing reality rather than experiencing it. And I do think it's more uh, anthropocentric, and that is not meant in any evaluative manner. Uh, but I think that is what she is concerned with. And I think that makes her more suitable uh, uh, for discussions around knowing reality. And, uh, you know, animals can't do metaphysics as far as we know, but it's less expandable beyond the non-human. So what I find more and more interesting with Scheler is how he connects the human being with other living beings. And then we can say, well, you know, resistance is something, everything that lives actually experiences. And uh, it's not only human beings, it's animals, it's, uh, it's plants and so on. And then we have a rise uh, of consciousness, even already in animals. And then he says in human beings, we have the rise of, uh, of self-consciousness. So I think Scheler kind of allows more for that kind of an extension, if that is something uh, uh, one is interested in. And uh, I do think that the diverging worldviews and, and philosophical anthropologies created barriers for their respective views on the possibility uh, of, uh, uh, of knowing. Again, it depends on where you're coming from. Uh, I think because specifically for Stein, uh, the basic principles of Christian faith are non-negotiable. She could not go, she couldn't have gone the direction that Scheler has gone down to the fact that even God himself 
would not be able to know uh, to know reality uh, and to know uh, existence. And uh, I think that's it. So uh, thank you very much.